Kevin Porter Jr. back like he never left, dropping 22 points and nine assists in his return to the Houston Rockets lineup. Jalen Green, fourth quarter takeover, but it just wasn't enough late against the L.A. Lakers. We're going to break it all down for you right here at Locked On Rockets. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. This is Mission Control, Houston. Ignition sequence start. With the second pick in the 2021 NBA Draft, the Houston Rockets select Jalen Green. T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. I'm going to keep working. I'm going to keep getting better every day. I'm going to keep perfecting my craft. And every time I step on that floor, I'm coming. Six, five, four, three, two, one. What's up and welcome to another episode of Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, native Houstonian and host of Locked on NBA Mondays. Be sure to follow along on Twitter at JT Gatlin and the show, of course, at Locked on Rockets. The Rockets, unfortunately, falling 132-123 to the LeBron James-led L.A. Lakers. The LeBron James at center led L.A. Lakers um, in Kevin Porter Jr.'s return. A lot to break down from this game. I want to focus on KPJ's return to the lineup and how good he looked in his first game back. Jalen Green having another strong outing as well as a fourth quarter takeover in this game. The defensive issues and lapses that we saw in this game as well as just the the overall outstanding defense played by David Nwaba. Josh Christopher with another solid outing. And where I want to start with all of this is Kevin Porter Jr. and his return to the Houston Rockets lineup, dropping 22 points, nine assists, had five boards, had a steal, had a block, eight of 17 shooting, all in 35 minutes on the floor. He had a really, really stellar game in his first game back in the lineup. And overall, Steven Silas was was raving about KPJ pregame, Post game, a pregame, he was talking about KPJ's importance as a defender and his growth on that end of the floor. And I want to focus on defense specifically in the second segment. So we'll get to that in just a moment. Post game, Steven Silas was just talking about how calm, cool, and collected KPJ looked out there on the floor. And I have to, you know, firmly agree. Kevin Porter Jr. stepped back in and was facilitating and controlling the tempo and the pace of the game, the exact way that we saw him doing it before his injury sidelined him. And he really looks so much more comfortable out there now. Uh, And I think that one of the, one of the things that I was really paying attention to during this game was how Kevin Porter jr. Was facilitating in transition. Right. And, And what really stood out to me is there was a moment in this game where KPJ was pushing the ball at the floor and he was like surveying, you know, where all his guys were in transition. And it was about probably like the half court mark. You know, he was crossing half court when he's, you know, like saw Armani Brooks crossing half court and getting ready to fill up the opposite side, the, the weak side wing. And KPJ made it, made, you know, was very intentional about driving the ball all the way into the teeth of the defense, kind of keeping his dribble alive and then pulling it back out just a little bit. And after sucking in the defense to then get the ball to Armani Brooks who promptly missed the three, unfortunately, but it was a really good thing to see, to see KPJ really surveying the court, seeing everybody, not like tunnel visioning, thinking, okay, I'm going to score or has to do this. He was very much playing within the flow of the offense and letting things come to him so naturally in this game. Felt like none of his threes were really forced in this one. He was five of nine from distance. He walked into a couple of them, just very like nonchalant in rhythm, stepping into some threes. He had one, you know, off, uh, you know, in the corner off of an assist from Jalen Green, I believe, which looked really, really good. So those two guys are finding ways to be able to feed off of each other. Not to mention we had another emphatic KPJ to Jalen Green alley oop lob, and those are always exhilarating, exciting, fun to see. Um, and it kind of sets the tone. Jalen was talking about post game, being able to feed 
off of KPJ's energy and how KPJ kind of had it going early. And then Jalen Green was able to kind of pick it up and had it going late and had that fourth quarter takeover of his, which was phenomenal. I mean, Jalen Green went into the fourth quarter with 10 points and finished with 24. He had 14 in the final frame, which is the most by a drafted rookie this season. Uh, which just goes to show when when Jalen Green's got it going, uh, you know it's really hard to defend him when he's got the three ball falling, which he did in this game, shot four of nine from beyond the arc. It makes it really really tough to be able to defend him. And the cha- the the deciding moment kind of in this game, unfortunately, uh, came by way of the referees who. Uh, look, I, I joked that look, I I hate blaming the refs for stuff. I really do. It's just it's not. Uh, it's not my cup of tea to want to sit here and blame the refs, but there was a such an obvious goaltending call on LeBron James. It really looked like goaltending in the moment. Even on replay, it looked like it was supposed to be an obvious goaltending call, and the referees decided to overturn the call on the floor. And there was a <clears throat> pool report with uh, crew chief Eric Lewis following the game conducted by Jonathan Fagan. And these are the questions that were asked of crew chief Eric Lewis. So here's the question on the overturned goaltending call on LeBron James. Why was that overturned? And if a player hits the rim on an opponent shot, is that not goaltending? Lewis said the rule states a player shall not touch the basket ring when the ball is using the basket ring as its lower base, nor can he vibrate the rim so as to cause the ball to make an unnatural bounce. Neither of those cases happened, which is why the challenge was successful. Another question, just to clarify, a player may not touch the rim if it causes those things to happen that you described. Lewis follows up and says he may not touch the rim when the ball is using the ring as its lower base or rolling around the ring. So in this instance, the ball was not on the ring when LeBron touched it and he did not cause the rim to vibrate or the backboard to vibrate to cause it to make an unnatural bounce. So it didn't impact the shot. Lewis says correct. And that's that. So I disagree with that, um, and that call very much changed the entire flow of the game. The Rockets at that moment were down 117-116. That would have given the Rockets a one-point edge, and instead it wound up being a jump ball controlled by the Lakers in center court, which then led to a Carmelo Anthony three-pointer off in the corner, and that was entirely frustrating because from that point, the Rockets just could not They basically let go of the rope at that point. That was kind of the deciding call of the game, unfortunately. And even Jalen Green commented on it post-game, saying that he wasn't even looking for the goaltending call. He was more looking for, there was a push in the back by LeBron James. Um, And he followed up saying, but it's Bron. He's going to get what he wants. Um, And, you know, no argument there. It's LeBron James. It's the LA Lakers. Um, And the NBA couldn't have the Lakers Uh, slide for their sixth straight loss against the baby Rockets. That wouldn't have been a good look. So past that, it was a competitive game for all of about, you know, it was a competitive fun game for all of about maybe 44, 45 minutes. And then those final like three minutes or so of regulation were kind of maddening given the calls or lack thereof or the reversal of said calls in those final moments. Uh, But overall, Kevin Porter Jr. had a phenomenal outing in his first game back. And I think that KPJ helps unlock so much for this Rockets offense. The Rockets did a great job in this game. Everybody scored in double figures except for David Nwaba. They had seven different guys in double figures in this game. They were moving the basketball well. They were sharing things with with each other well. They were getting out and running in transition. The different lineups that they were running, even though they were shorthanded with no Jay Sean Tate, no Garrison Matthews, no KJ Martin, no DJ Augustine, all these different guys out due to health and safety protocols and and all this stuff, they still found ways to be successful against what should be a Lakers team vying for championship contention, but it's basically just a super dysfunctional Lakers squad at this point. So I can't help but be really proud at the effort that this Houston Rockets team put forth in this game. Um, I do want to talk about the defense and the defensive lapses that we saw in this one and some of the causes for that. And we're going to, we're going to get there after a quick message from our friends over at Truebill. because look, when it comes to free trials, you know why they renew without your consent. It's a business scam out to get you. Don't let greedy corporations pocket your hard earned money. Download Truebill to finally take control of your subscriptions. Truebill is the new app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions that you don't need, want, or simply forgot about. 
On average, people save up to $720 per year with Truebill. Because companies make subscriptions so hard to cancel, Truebill makes it incredibly simple. Just link your accounts and Truebill will cancel your unwanted subscriptions in one tap, one click, one button press. It is that easy. Don't fall for any more subscription scams. Start canceling today at Truebill.com slash LockedOnMBA. Go right now. That's Truebill.com slash LockedOnMBA. It could save you thousands a year. That's Truebill.com slash LockedOnMBA. And continuing on here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. I will apologize for the tardiness of this episode and missing Tuesday's episode this week. Finally, when I thought I was turning the corner with my health, um, I came back in Monday. I was rearing to go. I was, you know, I, I felt good and and like 90, 95% healthy for the first time in a long time. And then I got my COVID booster Monday afternoon and it knocked me on my butt at about 1130 at night, Monday night, uh, after the Rockets game, I went and like, I had to like, I went and like laid down cause I was kind of fatigued like after the game. And then later that night, like I was on the spaces on Twitter and I was kind of like, okay. But then at about 1130, I was just like, I got like the aches and the chills and it like, I was like bedridden until like midway Tuesday afternoon. I didn't even think I was going to go in person to Rockets Lakers. And finally I like dragged myself out of bed and I like, you know, took some, took some pain meds and stuff. And I went, I was at the game and it was a good game, but then I got home and I just, I crashed out again. I was like, I made it to my couch and I drafted up like a few like show notes on my little like show guy, you know, not my script, but like my, you know, planning sheet that I have over here on my second monitor. And then like, yeah, I just, I passed out on the couch. It was not great. Um, and I'm like kind of back to normal now, but anyways, hopefully no more shenanigans from me this week. But with that, um, I want to focus on the defense here because I do think that overall <clears throat> the defensive game plan for the Rockets had to be, uh, like adjusted last minute and it, and it made things tough because the Lakers ran LeBron James at center. And this is LeBron James's first career start at center, and they just didn't run a five all game. And so, like, situationally, the Rockets were at a disadvantage because they were having to run Christian Wood and they were having to run Alper and Shingun as part of their eight man unit because they didn't have any other, they didn't have any other usual wings to throw out there. So, if they had their regular lineup, maybe they could have gone small and matched up a little bit better and, you know, not had the issues matching up. But, Steven Silas commented, I, I asked Steven Silas about David Nwaba's defense, specifically on LeBron James, because I thought David Nwaba did an excellent job defensively in this game, making LeBron James have to work so hard for all of his shots. Um, and so I want to run that back really quick, what Steven Silas had to say about the defense in this one. I'm finished with 32, but defensively, how did you feel about the game plan against him and specifically the efforts of David Nwaba to try and contain him? Dave did a good job. Dave was trying to hold him up as much as he could. The thing about LeBron, and I said it before the game, is you, you got to pick your poison because he's scoring so well right now, and it's so hard not to help. But the more help you give, then his, he's making those other guys great or better. So you see guys like Malik Monk who can benefit from LeBron and his, the gravity that he, atta he uh, attracts. So... I was proud of the job Dave did on did on him. He fought hard and this came up a little short. Did then playing LeBron at the five change your game plan at all? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it did. I mean, they didn't play a center tonight. So we had Seawood out there guarding Stanley Johnson, Alpi guarding Mello, Seawood guarding Mello. Yeah, it changed our, our game plan a lot. Them not playing with the center. I mean, it makes it, it makes it really hard. Really hard indeed. And, you know, I think that one of the areas of frustration for Rockets fans after this game specifically was that moment that I already highlighted, which was the kind of, I don't want to call it the dagger three, but it basically was the dagger three from Carmelo Anthony um, after the botched goaltending call was Christian Wood, you know, was guarding Mello and then Mello drifted off to the corner and <clears throat> Christian, you know, seemingly had a defensive lapse and didn't get out to Mello. And not only that, but there was a screen set on Jalen Green. So Jalen couldn't rotate out to Carmelo. So he basically had a wide open corner three and, you know, splashed it and gave the Lakers a four point lead. So where I, you know, 
I, I and I get the frustration with Christian for you know being upset about that and and not just that. I mean, there were there were plenty of moments all throughout this game. I mean, Carmelo had 24 points off the bench. Malik Monk went off for 25 points, you know, in this game. And there were a lot of moments where there were a lot of defensive lapses. It wasn't just Christian Wood. There were moments where Armani Brooks had some lapses. There were moments where Jalen had some lapses, where guys weren't, you know, on the same page about their rotations. And what I want to highlight, though, is, is what Steven Silas said, right? Having LeBron at the five completely changed their game plan to where you had guys like Christian, like Al P, having to defend out of position. And the natural inclination for those guys as a big is to want to help, right? Especially on drives and stuff of that nature. So in that play specifically where Christian Wood wasn't out on Carmelo Anthony on the perimeter, it's because Christian, as Carmelo was drifting to the opposite side of the floor, Christian sagged back in towards the paint to help on LeBron's drive. And that was the dagger, right? It's you either help. I mean, either LeBron's going to get what he wants right at the rim and potentially also draw an and one, right? And, and get to the free throw line and get three points that way, or he's going to kick it out to an open shooter. And so it's a pick your poison game with LeBron James. I don't think that Christian Woods should be, should be crucified for his defensive effort. I don't think it was like a lapse in defense, you know, in judgment, I guess. Um, I think it was more so just, again, as a big for C. Wood, Alpi had some moments too where he was a little late on closeouts in this game because their natural inclination is to be inside, you know, that help presence on drives, to contest shots at the rim, to be in position to rebound on misses, those kinds of things. And so when they're not, when the opposing team's not running a traditional five and they're running basically a full-blown five-out offense where one of those guys is having to check a wing, essentially, it makes things a little bit harder defensively. And while I'm not like excusing the Rockets defense in this game, and I, I do think that overall they needed to be a little bit better about their rotations, about especially in transition. I felt like the Lakers, obviously, you know, the number one team in the league in pace, um, getting the ball up and down the floor in a hurry, uh, and the Rockets struggling with their transition defense another year in a row. Uh, that's an area that I'd love to see them be able to improve upon. But it's building blocks, right? And that having LeBron James be be at the five in this game unlocked a lot for this Lakers team. And unfortunately for the Rockets, not having their usual personnel on hand to combat that, this may have been a game where maybe Al P wouldn't have gotten even the 15 minutes that he did get if the Lakers, if if KJ and if Jay Sean were available, because then maybe the Rockets would have run like the Tate Wagon lineup for stretches of this game, that kind of thing. Um, but overall, I'm not, again, I'm not super upset about the outcome of this game because the Rockets were hanging tough with a, you know, with future Hall of Fame. Look, at one point this game, the Rockets had multiple rookies all out there, right? They had uh, Jalen Green, Josh Christopher, Alper and Shingoon, Kevin Porter Jr., who's, you know, for all intents and purposes, like basically a second year player uh, as far as like total games played. And then Eric Gordon was like babysitting that lineup. And they were going up against future Hall of Famers in LeBron James, Russell Westbrook, Carmelo Anthony, like, and holding their own and like fighting their way back into the game. So, like, I'm proud of the effort that they put forth, right? Like, they could have just rolled over at the top of the fourth quarter when the Lakers went on that run at the top of the fourth and went up by double digits. But no, like, they 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 put their heads down, they fought hard, they got back into this game, and they gave themselves a chance to win it. And that's all you can ask from this group of young guys, right? They played hard, and they they have done a good job. They, bought, they have bought in defensively, and I think that's a great thing to see for a group of young guys is that they are completely bought in on the defensive side of the ball. And yeah, they're still going to make mistakes. They're still going to have some miscues here and there. But knowing that they are at least trying and putting their best foot forward on that end is huge. And I've got a clip that I want to run back uh, from, Jay, uh, from I should say, Kevin Porter Jr. talking about his defensive you know, mentality post-game. And we're going to get there after a quick message from our friends over at betonline.ag because BetOnline has you covered this holiday season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before as football continues on and college bowl season marches on. 
Bet Online remains your number one spot for all the sports action this season. Head over to their website and use promo code Locked On to get a fifty percent welcome bonus on their on your very first deposit. Again, that's a fifty percent bonus using promo code Locked On on your very first deposit from basketball, football, NHL, boxing, UFC, even your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the twenty twenty one season. Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all of your favorite sports. So don't wait to take advantage of all the new amazing offers available. Bet Online, where the game starts and another message from my friends over at built bar because it's the new year so that means new year's resolutions if yours is about getting fit or eating healthier make sure you include built bar in your plan built bar is the protein bar that tastes like a candy bar honestly maybe even better than a candy bar Built Bar makes it easy to stick to your New Year's resolution because it tastes so good. You'll want to eat it, unlike other protein bars, which can be chalky or waxy or just overall like not 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 delicious, right? Built Bar has got so many amazing flavors that you can choose from: raspberry, mint chocolate, coconut brownie chunk, which is my personal favorite, peanut butter. You name it, they probably got it as a flavor. Strawberry is another good one. Cookies and cream. I can go on and on and on about the Built Bar flavors, right? You can check them out. Just visit built.com and use promo code LOCK15 for 15% off your very next order of the best tasting protein bars on the market. Again, for your New Year's, New Year's resolutions, you've got to check out Built Bar. That's 15% off using promo code LOCK15 at built.com. And final segment here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. So I want to run back uh, this clip from Kevin Porter Jr. post game talking about uh, in, you know, kind of embracing more of a defensive mentality this season. As you kind of turn the corner defensively yourself, um, are you, are you able to kind of take that leadership and kind of have a, vo a vocal response to the rest of the team, kind of have that expectation of them to also put their best for, foot forward defensively, since that's what you're able to do on the floor now? Yeah. Um, it took me a minute to learn, uh, the spots on uh, defense, um, regarding the help. But uh, on ball, I've always I've always been good when I wanted to. Uh, but this is the first year I, I took uh, pride in defense to a, a, like a whole nother level. And um, I just want my guys to have that same energy. Like we get a, we get a lot of uh, energy from David uh, Waba. And um, like you said tonight, uh, he did he did a good job disrupting Brian and uh, making it hard for him, making him uh, more of a playmaker than uh, dominating the game. And um, I want to be basically like David, uh, be a, a energy um, on the defensive side with my with my on ball, with my help rotations, but vocal, uh, more so vocally, uh, communicate uh, where the low man's supposed to be, the switches, and uh, if if I don't hear the switch, then I'm gonna call it for them, like things like that. Uh, just having my boys back because I know he got mine. So great. Great to hear that from Kevin Porter Jr. And it it has been noticeable, the step up that he has made defensively this season. Again, Steven Silas has commented on it uh, regularly, talking about what KPJ is able to do defensively. We can look back to the previous matchups against the Lakers where KPJ drew the task of guarding LeBron situationally in some of those matchups, in some of those games. And so I think that hearing that from KPJ and then also seeing it translate on the floor is great. And then also, right, we've heard a lot of that talk from Jalen Green. You know, pre-draft, during the draft, post-draft, Jalen Green has said repeatedly that he wants to be a two-way player, that he wants to be a good defender. And we're also seeing that on kind of translate on the floor is Jalen Green has the tools to be a good defender. He's got the, 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 the wingspan. He's got the quickness. He's got the solid hands. He can play passing lanes. And so having that mentality instilled in the backcourt of the future for the Rockets leads me to believe that as they are figuring things out offensively, defensively, like they're also going to be able to make their mark on a game. Am I ever expecting either of them to be like true blue, like lockdown, like all NBA caliber level, level defenders? No, I don't want, I'm not going to set the bar crazy high for those two guys, but it's still great to know that that's the right mentality that they're embodying for this team moving forward, because you don't expect young guys to want to be to to be priding themselves on their defense right you don't expect you know a, a guy who's just you know couple you know a couple seasons under his belt to be talking about making an impact and being a vocal leader defensively a la a David Nwaba type right you don't expect Jalen Green to be making the strides that he's made defensively at such an early age so I really like seeing that from those guys and I like hearing it and, and you know continuing to watch that growth for them on that side of the basketball overall 
you know, I thought this was just a really solid game for the Rockets. Christian Wood, I think, looked really good despite, you know, some of the what I already highlighted as were some of the defensive lapses and struggles that re realistically the entire team was dealing with because of the matchup issues against the Lakers. But overall, I mean, you know, he had a couple uh, ill-advised passes offensively, but past that 22 points on eight of 12 shooting shot three of four from behind the three point line, three of six, at the charity stripe. You'd like to see that be a little bit better, especially the one free throw that he missed in crunch time. Um, only six rebounds, but again, that was really tough because the Lakers were spaced out. And so Christian Wood was, you know, caught out on the perimeter a lot and, and out of position for a lot of rebounds in this game, unfortunately. And when you're, having to battle against LeBron James and Russell Westbrook, two of the best rebounders at their respective positions, um, which I guess LeBron James is a center now. So that's cool. No, I mean, it, it was, it was a game where I think the entire team needed to do a better job of rebounding by committee, boxing out that kind of thing, and really attacking the glass as a team. And you can't just pin all that blame on, on, on Christian Wood, right? Like you can't just look at Christian Wood and say, Oh, he only had six rebounds. He had a bad game, right? He should have had, you know, 12 or 13. No. Like Alper and Shingoon only had two rebounds. Like, are we going to crucify Alper and Shingoon as well for for not securing boards? Um, no, it was just it was one of those games where it was a very weird dynamic playing against the Lakers team without a true center out there, and with LeBron James being at center, it caused a lot of problems for this Rockets team. Um, last guy that I want to talk about is Josh Christopher, who I think had another really solid game. Continues to impress when he gets minutes. Had 14 points. Had two, uh, three rebounds, I should say, two assists and three steals. Uh, shot five of eight from the floor, played 27 minutes. Uh, he was great in his time on the floor. Didn't hit either of his two three-point attempts, unfortunately, in this game. But other than that, had a really, really solid overall game, including he absolutely picked Westbrook's pocket uh, and then got out in the open floor for a breakaway slam, which was a, one of the highlights of the night. Um, and, and Josh Christopher has shown you know his ability to drive, right? He's got that NBA... Like he's already filled out for like an NBA body. And so he doesn't get pushed around nearly as easily as like Jalen and sometimes KPJ do. So he's shown his ability to drive to the rim, to, to finish through contact uh, and finish well at the rim. So seeing him continue to get these minutes, it's great. You know, if there's a silver lining anywhere in uh, the inconsistency with the lineups that the Rockets have had over this last month or so, starting with, uh, Jalen being out, then with KPJ being out, and now with DJ Augustine being out, is that it's really opened the door for Josh Christopher to get some extended run. And I think now that we've seen him play consistently enough at the NBA level, Josh Christopher should not ever, I do not ever want to see Josh Christopher play another minute for the RGV Vipers. Doesn't need to happen. He is an NBA level talent. Um, you know, and, and this remain right i was not high on josh christopher coming out of the draft right and, and i thought he was like the the culture pick he was you know jalen green's best bud like all this stuff and he has proven me wrong and i i absolutely love it i love being proven wrong and josh christopher has gone out there and shown that he has put in the work his shot looks good um his again his ability to drive his driving kick game his defense the point of attack defense is at times a little suspect um overall i think his defensive intensity is where it needs to be and he like means well on that end but at times just the defensive iq isn't quite there like you know you know choking up on a defender uh or trying to body a defender like way out past the three point line and then getting beat off the dribble like things like that but those will come with time overall he's got good defensive instincts and chops um and it's just about refining those skills and molding him into a really quality level NBA player. But I'm going to make the point right now. I, I honestly, like, I think that Josh Christopher should, you know, get basically like the DJ Augustine minutes moving forward. Um, you know, because I think that Garrison Matthews and when, when he's back in the lineup and Armani Brooks provide such a unique level of shooting and spacing that they're almost like must haves in the rotation. And, you know, almost to the, to the point of making sure that there's at least one of them on the floor at all times, obviously Garrison will get a bulk of those minutes. Um, and hopefully he'll continue to be the starter moving forward. Uh, the starting lineup that I'd like to see would be KPJ, Jalen green, Garrison Matthews, Jay Sean Tate and Christian wood. That would be my ideal starting five. And then you stagger Garrison Matthews and Armani Brooks so that there's always one of them on the floor at all times. 
But I think with Josh Christopher, he's shown an ability to have the ball in his hands. He's shown an ability to run those second units. Uh, He's also shown an ability to play off ball if necessary. So I think you can stagger a guard lineup of KPJ, Jalen Green, Eric Gordon, and Josh Christopher, and have that be basically your four guards with some, you know, sprinkling in some Armani Brooks minutes. But overall, I think that Josh Christopher has earned it. He's played really, really well in this stretch with no Jalen Green, no KPJ. And I don't want to see his minutes reduced just because those two guys are back. And frankly, here's where we're at. DJ Augustine's the veteran, right? He's the guy that, you know, ultimately, you know, this, this season should be about development, about seeing what the young guys can do. And I'd rather see Josh Christopher get those minutes than DJ Augustine, right? You know, maybe they decide to make like DJ slash Armani, like the 10th or 11th guy in the rotation situationally, that kind of thing. But I think Josh Christopher has absolutely proven himself to be worthy of rotation minutes moving forward for this Rockets team. So overall, a competitive, hard fought game. Um, it was, a it was a fun night out. I mean, Really, uh, Eric Gordon had his first like kind of quiet game in a while, only 13 points on five of six shooting, but it's because the other guys were kind of filling it up. Um, so it's not like Eric Gordon had to go off for 20 something points because Seawood, KPJ and Jalen Green all scored 20 plus. Also, I do believe this is the first time that Jalen Green has scored back to back 20 plus games. And it just goes to show that the spacing was largely the issue, um, you know, and if this is going to be a new regular thing for Jalen Green moving forward, where he's just going to be casually, you know, scoring 20 plus a night because he has all this room to operate now, the rookie of the year conversation better get ready to be talking about a new name entering the ring because Jalen Green is going to start making some serious noise this second half of the season. But with that, that's going to be it for today's episode. Uh, If you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcast, Apple, Spotify, Google, the brand new Odyssey app, free and available on all platforms. Also check out the Locked on Rockets YouTube channel, search Locked on Rockets on YouTube, subscribe, like, comment, all that good stuff. As always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And we look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball.